Listening test. This test has three parts. In each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract, and you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions one to twenty-four, complete the notes with information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract one. Extract one. Questions one to twelve. For questions one to twelve, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have thirty seconds to look at the notes. Mr. Murray, I'm Dr. Corbett. Nice to meet you. Yes, sir. Nice to meet you. Yeah, first time we've met. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I understand you made an ex uh, appointment for an examination. Yes, correct. Uh, and we're going to a complete physical examination. I understand. Yes. And I'm going to ask you about why you came into that. But would you mind if I take a few notes just in case? No, that'd be fine. In case you got lots to tell me. Yeah. Don't want to miss too much. That'd be fine. Good. Good. So you made the appointment for an exam. Uh, when's the last time you had? A physical examination? Uh, probably two years ago. Two years ago. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, let me tell me why you made this one. Well, I had these uh, chronic headaches going on mm -hmm. that I've had for about three months now, and it's just not getting any better. And I want to see if there's something we can do about it. Mm -hmm. So, when you say chronic, you're referring to the fact that they've just been steady for three months, or they've been longer than that? Well, it started three months ago, um, mm -hmm. and they're like every other day or so, and mm -hmm. now I'm having them every day. And so you have no days when you don't have a headache? I have a headache every day. Mm -hmm. But at the beginning, it didn't seem to be quite as noticeable no. then for you. No. Des describe the headaches. Where are they, and what, what do they feel like? Um, they start at the back of my head here, mm -hmm. and they kind of come up around my temples, I guess you call mm -hmm. it. And, into the front of my head. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Sometimes they're throbbing. Mm -hmm. You know, other times they're not quite as bad. Yeah. Um, hmm. So it's both sides of your. Yeah. It starts in the back and comes up the front. Correct. Do you have a headache all the time, or does it just come in? Um, well, I have a headache all the time until I take something. Mm -hmm. I, I take Advil and Tylenol mm -hmm. that seem to help it, and that eases it up. Is it ever gone? Um, there's always something there. There's always something there. I always know it's there. It's mm -hmm. just the intensity of it. I see. Can you tell me a little bit more about what you notice? For example, when is it the worst? At night, in the morning, or does it make a difference? Um, well, it, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. When I don't get enough sleep, mm -hmm. it's really bad. Mm -hmm. um, if I move my head in a certain way or if I strain, or stretch my head in a certain way. Mm -hmm. Like what, what way? Can you show me that? If I, if I go like, you know, to the, to the back, or mm -hmm. if I, even if I'm, you know, bending over, mm -hmm. um, just mm -hmm. any any exaggerated move. Any exaggerated move makes yeah, it seems worse. to make it worse. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if I don't take the Advil and the Tylenol, it, mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. seems to be worse. It makes it worse too. I see. So this three months ago it started. It's mm -hmm. both sides. It's in the back, and you can make it worse if you. Either extend or yes. what, lean forward for too long. Is yes, any it? any just I call them exaggerated head movements. Yeah. So what happens when you're lying down? Um, does that ease it or make it worse? I, I think that makes it eases it some. It does. You know, especially if I can get some sleep. I see. It seems to ease it up. Some. So the act of lying down and sleeping is, doesn't make it worse. No, I it makes say, it better. Maybe. Yes. I see. I see. Uh, and. Uh, does this does it change what, based on if you're eating, for example? No. Um, you know, does eating make it worse? Or better? No, eating doesn't seem to. So, I mean, the full stomach doesn't, doesn't no. seem to bother at all. Uh -huh. you know? 
How about if you're concentrating is when you're driving? Um, or, some, or reading? No, it doesn't make it worse except when it's really bad. I have a hard time focusing. Okay. Yeah. You know. That's helpful. Yeah. 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 Does it ever seem to be more one side than the other? No, it always seems to come up and be just it kind of like meets in the middle. Meets in the middle, huh? Starts in the back, yeah. goes around, meets in the middle. It's like a tight band. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And the part that's always there is what? In the back or all over? I would say in the back. In the back yeah. too. Yeah. Always starts in the back. I got rear-ended in a, a car accident. And I can remember um, my neck got jerked. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a sore neck for a couple of days, and then the headache started shortly after that. So that accident started this thing off. That's when it all so started. So you had no headache before that? No, I had no... That's helpful. No previous headache. So somebody ha tell me about that. How, <coughs> how fast were you? Were they going? Well, it wasn't very fast. It was in a parking lot. Mm. And I was backing out, and somebody else was backing out the other way, and we met. And I just remember that jerk of my head gotcha. and um, having a stiff, sore neck. So both cars days. couldn't have been going more than startup. Yeah. Okay. I must have been or something like that. Did you strike your head when that happened? No. Did I you recall? Not, not that I recall. No. Mm -hmm. I just remember it kind of being, I guess they call it whiplash. Mm -hmm. Did you get out of the car right away? Um, no, I sat there for a few minutes, and then I got out of the Did car. You? It startled me. Did you? Yeah. Then you said the headache started after that. How long after the actual accident did the headache start? Three or four days after. So it wasn't right away. There it wasn't was a little right bit away. of a warm-up. Yeah. There was a, kind of an interval in there where you yes. fine. I see. Did you think that you had hurt yourself? Um, I didn't think I really had hurt myself. I didn't, you know, mm -hmm. I, I felt startled and, you know, mm -hmm. just kind of shaken, but I didn't feel like I was really injured. But then, okay. I didn't go to the hospital or anything like that. Yeah. Have you, uh, and you said you take some things for it. What, what actually helps it? What do you? Uh, Tylenol and Advil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I take, you know, I guess it's. How much do you take? I take a lot. I take 16 Advils. Four tabs, four times a day. Wow! And I take self-prescribed. Yes, two Tylenols four times a day. So I'm taking eight Tylenol and sixteen. Twenty-four pills a day. Oh, wow! I take it you warmed up to that that you weren't using. Right. That. I started out with less and it wasn't working, so I just I kept see. adding to it, and it, it does give me some relief. It's a lot of medication. It doesn't. Yeah, it seems like too much. That's Is one that of the reasons I came to see you. Good for you. Yeah. Does that mean it just keeps getting worse? Um, the headaches just kept getting worse in the severity of them, yes. Yeah. That's a lot of medication. Yes. Did, before you had this accident, did you use those medications much, if at all? No, very seldom. No, never had to take that kind of thing with no. regularity? No. Okay. okay. Uh, I need to know, too, what else do you experience? Anything else? Does this make your body feel different or painful or um, uncomfortable in any it, way? It, it makes you feel stressed. Mm -hmm. I feel stressful with mm -hmm. it. Um, I can't sleep well. Mm -hmm. um, I just it, it's uncomfortable. Yeah, it's just yeah. kind of a nagging mm -hmm. thing that's there all the time. Does it bother your shoulders, your arms? You feel mm -hmm. anything down here? No, no. Strength? Pretty good. Tingling? No, no. Really. How about just being able to use your arms in normal motion? Yeah, I. That's I, not I, disturbed at all. No, that's fine. I see. That's fine. I see. Wow, so you had an accident, took a couple of days for this thing to get to you, three or four days, mm -hmm. but then it started bothering you and persists, and now almost has this stubborn worsening. Is that what I'm... Daily. 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 What, and what kind of work do you do? Uh, I work in a car dealership. I'm a service manager. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So what's, has this had an impact on your ability to just do your normal work? <clears throat> well, again, it, it has in that it just, it's just, it's uncomfortable, it's... Mm -hmm. it's I feel stressed because of it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm able to do my job. Um, I so like you my job. You work. Not, yeah. Have you missed any days from work? Um, I think I missed two days in the beginning, but I've been mm -hmm. at work since then. I'm, I'm able to go to work, but I make sure I have my Advil mm -hmm. and Tylenol with me. Mm -hmm. um, other, well, than, yeah, other than that, I'm, I'm working. You sound like a great employee to me. To work through this kind of thing is pretty difficult. Well, I, I like what I do. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I work on vintage cars on the side. I see. I see. Yeah. And so I okay. Try to make it. You know, I have a sense of what you're telling me. What's been your What's your diagnosis? I don't know if I did something to um, my spinal column back there. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. um, I don't know what you guys call it, but uh, I, something happened when I got mm -hmm. hit. Mm -hmm. 
is what I think. A jerk did something. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, other than that, I don't really don't yeah. know what it is. And, but you're fairly sure there was a couple of days in there where you, it wasn't obvious to you that there was anything wrong? Other than it just being sore. Okay. It was sore and, and stiff. But the headaches didn't start, like I said, until about three or four days later. So there was some discomfort. Yes, right there away. Was. But you would call it more soreness or stiffness. Yes. Than actual headache that, like, you're right. Okay. right. Right. Yeah. I need to know a few more things okay. about the effect of this one. How's your sleeping? Do you sleep okay? No, I don't sleep well at all. Why not? Um, the headache, the, the, the discomfort. It's hard to get to sleep. Um, mm-hmm. I sometimes can get to sleep, and then the headache wakes me up. Mm-hmm. Um, so my sleep patterns have been totally so that's disrupted. Story. So how much sleep are you getting at night compared to what you like to get? Well, I used to sleep the night through, which was probably at least eight hours. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'm probably up three and four times a night now. Wow. And how long is that? I would call it a sleep deficit. How long has that been going on? Uh, well, this happened three months ago, probably two and a half months now. Mm-hmm. Because it, it wasn't as bad in the beginning, but they did just get worse. Yeah. Did you consult with anybody else, or even just toughen this out on your own? Just been toughening it out on my own and yeah. trying to, mm-hmm. hoping it will go away, but it's, mm-hmm. it's just getting worse. But you haven't been able to do your work, think, use your hands. Yes. Nothing, yeah. nothing disturbed in that way. Huh? No. Gotcha. Anybody else know? Did your wife? Are you married? Yes, I am. You've been yeah. talking to your wife about this. She, she certainly knows. Extract 2, questions 13 to 24. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Could you please state your name and your birth date? Why are you asking me this? Well, I just want to make sure that you are who I think you are. Well, that's a good idea. Ron Jones, mm-hmm. December 15th, 1955. Okay, and this is really just a safety check just to make sure I got the correct patient. And I do. My name is Sue, and I'm one of the nurses here. Pleased to meet you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to just be asking you a few questions, a bit of a history, and I may be taking notes. It's just about that. Mm-hmm. So, what brings you to our clinic today? I've got a cough. but I've had a cough for a while now. Mm-hmm. This past week, it seems to be getting worse, and I'm coughing stuff up. Some stuff. Can you tell me about the stuff you're coughing up or the sputum you're bringing up? It seems yellowish, uh, but maybe sometimes greenish looking. And how are you feeling generally overall? Well, I feel a bit tired all the time. Okay. Do you, are you having any fever or chills? No. No? Are you on any medications? Yes, I had been taking some antibiotics. Okay. They didn't seem to do much, so I stopped taking them. Okay, well, I'm just going to give you a little information. Antibiotics work best when you take the whole dosage. Um, If you start and stop them, the bacteria might not be killed, and then then it can come back and be a little bit stronger. And uh, it's one of the medications where you should take the whole dose with, um, and it's usually only seven or ten days at a time, but you should take all of it. I didn't know that. Thanks for the information. Oh, no problem. Back to your cough. Are you a smoker? Yes, I smoke for a long time. Okay, can you tell me how many years of smoking that is? Uh, two packs a day, just about. And for how long? It's 35 years now. Have you ever thought about quitting? Yes, but it's really hard now. Yeah, I've, he- I've heard that it is. I haven't experienced that, but I have some information on a smoker's helpline. Are you? Would you like to, to see that? Sure. What have I got to lose? Okay. Well, I'll give that to you before you leave. Um, I know you've told me you don't have a fever, but I would like to take your blood pressure, pulse, your vital signs just before the the doctor comes to see you. So is that okay with you? Sure. And I'd like to listen to your chest as well. Okay. Okay. Good. Well, I'll get that ready. First, I'm going to take your temperature. Okay. 
just stick this under your tongue. I'll hold it because it's kind of heavy. Shouldn't be beeping in a minute. Great. Okay. I'm just going to put this in the garbage. And I'm going to take your blood pressure. Now I need to climb up and grab this. You've had your blood pressure done before? Yes. Okay. So I need your arm. It's going to pull your... And I'm going to have to get my stethoscope. And have you had your blood pressure done before? Yes. Okay. Do you know what it is? No. no. Now I'll take your blood pressure. Your temperature is 37, your pulse is 88, your blood pressure is 150 over 84, and your respirations were 16. Now I need to listen to your chest sounds for the last part. I'll do that. Can you take a deep breath in and breathe out? And again, one more time, and again. Okay, great. I hear wheezing in your the lower part of your lungs. Are you, do you feel that when you're breathing? I think so, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I've got your vital signs, and I've listened to your chest with some wheezing. The doctor's going to be coming in next. I'm just going to give her the results of what I've just done, and she'll come and visit with you, and uh, then I'll see you after that. Okay. Okay, Thanks. good. All right. Okay, I'm back. The doctor has uh, heard the very same things that I heard. Uh, she's told me she's going to give you some inhalers to use at home. Have you ever used an inhaler before? Yes, I have, but they didn't even show me how to use a spacer. Oh, that's great. The spacer is supposed to help get the drug down deep into your lungs where it can work um, where it's supposed to. And have you ever had two inhalers before? No, why? Well, they're two different drugs, and you need to know which one you should take first for the best the best um, medication usage for your body. So one of the in, um, inhalers opens the tubes in your, in your respiratory or your lungs, a little bit bigger, so it should be taken first. And then when you take the second drug, it goes a little bit deeper. It can go, the passageway is bigger, so it can go down into your lungs better. And it's an anti-inflammatory, so that drug is best to go second to get down to where the inflammation in your lungs is, is happening, causing you some problems. I had no idea that it would matter which one I took first. Yeah, you know what? Mo many people don't know that, so it's, that's why I explained it, because if you understand, it makes so much more sense in, in how you should take them. I learned a lot today, both about antibiotics and now inhalers. Yeah, good. I'm glad I could help with the information. And uh, anything? So what's next? Well, I think you can go home with your prescriptions. Uh, the doctor wants you to come back in about 10 days and take a next course, another course of antibiotics, but the whole dose. And um, 10 days later from now, you can make an appointment. So you make the appointment today on your way out, and uh, you'll be seen again um, then. Okay. Thanks for everything. I'll see you next week. Oh, yeah. Can I get that uh, helpline number? Oh, right. I did get it when I was out of the room. So here it is. It's for you, the helpline number, and you give them a call and see what happens. Okay, thanks. Okay, great. Bye. Bye-bye. Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, 
you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. Now read the question. We're going to be taking care of you today. Would it be okay if we ask you a few questions? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. I'm just going to verify your first and last name. If you could tell me your first name for me. It's Lori. All right, and last name? Smith. All right, and your birth date? August 1st of 1974. All right, and where would you prefer to be called? You can just call me Lori. All right, it's nice okay. to meet you. Thank you, yes, nice to meet you. So Lori was admitted last night with an asthma exacerbation. Okay. Uh, during the night you had a couple of breathing treatments, correct? Yes. Okay, you feeling better since the breathing treatment? Yeah. Okay. Um, they also gave her some prednisone as well during the night. Okay. So the plan, hopefully, is to have you discharged later today if you continue to feel better. Okay. Um, do you have any questions for us so far? Am I getting any more treatments before I leave? So they have another treatment scheduled in about an hour for you. Okay. Um, if things get worse before then, you can give us a call, and we'll certainly be back in, and we can reassess the situation then. Okay. Um, do you mind if we listen to your lungs at all? No, go ahead. That's okay. fine. How's your breathing right now? It's better than it was. Any pain at all anywhere? No. Okay. I'm just going to go ahead and take a listen here. You can take some nice deep breaths for me, okay? Question 26. Now read the question. Excuse me, I'm a little chilly. Can I have that blanket, please? What? What do you mean? The blanket. I'm a little cold. Did we do surgery on your arm? Uh, excuse me? Did we do surgery on your arm? No, but I'm in a lot of pain. I want to, to see you go grab that blanket and pull it up. There is no reason why you can't pull that blanket up. I'm in a lot of, I have a lot of back pain now. Uh, I have some medication. Well, you're supposed to be in pain. You had surgery, so you're going to be in some pain. Hold hold on a minute. I have a lot of pain though, ma'am. <sighs> okay, I'll be in in a little bit. Question 27. Now read the question. These devices are incredibly simple. There's just two buttons on it that you need to know about. The first one is the green one, which says on and off. And that's the first step, stage one, turn it on. Call emergency medical services now. It tells you exactly what to do. All clothing from chest and stomach. Peel off the pad labeled one. Now we've got the pads on the patient's chest. The next thing is the device will analyze the rhythm and recommend a shock if appropriate. Shock advised. Stand clear. It's asking me to press the button to give the shock. Shock delivered. So that's the shock delivered. Now what will happen is that you'll carry on doing CPR if appropriate and the, the machine will go into a cycle then when it reanalyzes and gives further shocks if need be. But all you need to do is just listen to what it's telling you. Begin CPR now. And this one's even got a little button that if you press it, it'll give a sound prompt so you can get your CPR at exactly the right rate. Trust me, if I can work one, so can you. Question 28. Now read the question.
So you as a doctor may be seeing dozens of patients in a single day. How will a system like this affect your day? Well, I'm, I'm an emergency physician, so I work in an area where there's patients in rooms all around me. They all have questions. I can't tell you the number of times a day I see a patient limp out of a room and they want to know when lunch is coming. If we could get them the answers without them having to come out and search for someone to answer the question, it's a win for everybody. Question 29. Now read the question. You know, nurses often play an integral role in all of our lives. They're the comforters and caregivers uh, in the best and worst of times. And uh, this week is National Nurses Week, by the way. And mm -hmm. Perry has a very touching story of a nurse and her patient. Yeah, well, Nicole Leroy has lived this story for the last year and a half, but it's just now being told. A stop inside the little clinic in the Hyde Park Kroger during her lunch hour one afternoon and a chance meeting with the nurse working that day may have saved her life. This is a journey Nicole Leroy has been waiting a year and a half to take, back to see her nurse at the little clinic. Hi. Hi. Oh. How are you? Good. I just want to thank you. Jessica Smith, a family nurse practitioner at the little clinic, listened to Nicole, something several doctors hadn't done. You researched, you looked in your book, you tried to figure out what it could be. And um, a month later, I found out that I have oh, cancer. Wow. Cancer. Stage 2 Hodgkin's lymphoma. I'm 36 years old. I'm in the best shape of my life. You don't think it could happen to you. A diagnosis a year in the making. I've been to a gynecologist, a dermatologist, primary care twice. And each one of them told me that I was either uh, just virus clogs in my lymph nodes or that I was self-inflicting or that I had depression, I had anxiety. But Jessica thought it could be serious, so she encouraged Nicole to keep fighting. She looked me in the eye and she said, you need to go follow up further. You need to go see your doctor again. You need to push. Question 30. Now read the question. Now look at question 25. So, um, can I listen to the baby? Yep. Okay. Um, you want to do any Part C. In this part of the test, 
you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at extract 1. Extract 1, questions 31 to 36. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. Here on Health Support, we cover all sorts of search. The Mediterranean diet, what fat is right for you, how much salt is safe, diets to protect you from diabetes, early death, heart disease. So this next segment is actually a bit perturbing. We're being told that almost all this research is wrong. Yes, John Yanidis is Professor of Medicine at Stanford University, and he says the scientific approach taken by nutritional researchers is nowhere near rigorous enough, and we have to go back to basics if we're to learn anything significant about how diets impact health. Thank you for inviting me. Now, we've had you on lots of times before, talking about various things and uh, demolishing a few iconic areas of health and research. You're arguing that nutritional research needs radical reform. On what basis do you say that? Well, th there's clearly a factory of papers being produced in uh, nutrition uh, epidemiology in particular, that don't meet very high standards of credibility. The type of research that is being done in nutritional epidemiology, it's not an issue that there's bad scientists involved in it. You know, maybe excellent scientists are involved in it, but the odds of getting it right are extremely small. Let's look at that in a moment, but you quote in your paper some really bizarre conclusions that you might come to from, uh, if you've believed, past nutritional research. Do you want to just tell us some of those bizarre findings in the, the relation to either longevity or shortened lifespan? Most of these studies are not experimental. They're not randomized. They're just uh, observing people who report what they eat and they take that seriously that this is reflecting exactly what they ate, which is one major assumption. Second, people take these behaviors and these numbers as causal, which means that they look at the numbers and they translate them to an effect of these nutrients or of these foods on mortality. And then they also make a another assumption that uh, these risks are applicable to the entire lifespan. So then uh, let's take a number like 15% uh, relative risk reduction in mortality or 15% increase in survival which is a typical number that comes out of these studies. And this is uh, the number that is the summary of all the data, for example, on what is the benefit with eating 12 hazelnuts a day. Mm -hmm. uh, if you translate that to a gain in uh, survival, you take 80 years, you multiply that by 15%. This looks like a 12-year gain in survival just by eating 12 hazelnuts a day or or literally one hazelnut a day would give you one more year of life uh, as a benefit. It's a ridiculous calculation. It is not so, of course. 
even if you believe that one of these foods or one of these nutrients or a couple of them may be important, it's impossible to believe that every single food, every single nutrient will have such tremendous benefits or such tremendous risks. So you, you get there because of there's multiple levels of unreliability. Is that what it is? That essentially the food diary is unreliable, they're not controlling for other factors such as education and other environmental factors properly and they all conflate together to give you bizarre results. Is that what's going on? Exactly. It's a, it's a problem at multiple levels. It's an extremely difficult field to study. And it doesn't mean that observational studies, that epidemiological studies get it wrong all the time. In many other fields, the problems are much more straightforward. For example, we know for sure that smoking is killing zillions of people. It will kill one billion people in the next century unless we do something. But the, the effect uh, of smoking is huge. Uh, the, the risk increases 20-fold if uh, someone is smoking for getting lung cancer. But just to challenge you on that, whilst we're confident in smoking, why are we confident in smoking and not in coffee? Because there have been no randomized controlled trials of getting people to smoke and other people not to smoke. I mean, so that's still on observational studies, is it not? The major difference with smoking is that the uh, the effect is tremendous. Uh, We're talking, as I said, of a 20-fold increase in risk of lung cancer, 10-fold increase in cardiovascular disease. Uh, Many other diseases have tremendous increase in risk. For each single nutrient, each single uh, thing that we eat or drink, the effect, even if you take these studies literally, are much, much, much smaller. And based on what we know from some randomized trials that we have done, the effects are pretty much close to null, if not exactly null. I mean, it's very likely that they're exactly null, which means that it's a complete waste to even try to pursue them any further. What about we cannot really use epidemiology to study a relative risk of 1.01. We can do it to study a relative risk of 20, which is what's the case for smoking. And just to dissect that out for a non, people who don't know the statistics, is that 1.01 is, there's no effect, 1.01 is just tiny, whereas 20, an effect of 20 is 20 times the risk. So 1.01 is just a little bit over what would be normal and probably within normal limits. So uh, what about eating patterns? I mean, you yourself have been involved in trials of the Mediterranean diet. So I think that eating patterns in theory might be able to get you a little bit of that complexity of all these nutrients interacting together. But even those are very difficult, if not impossible, to study within an observational context. Again, you have most of these problems operating. Number one, you need to ask people what type of eating pattern they're following, and you know responses may be accurate or very often may be very inaccurate, especially if you try to recall what you ate and tell what you're doing. Just try it to yourself and, <laughs> and, and see whether that information would be reliable. The second problem is that you still have extreme complexity among all these nutrients. We we have over 200,000 different foods that you can combine in different ways. There's no clear eating pattern that each one of us is following. We follow different eating patterns in different periods of our lives and different days even. And it also changes all the time. If you superimpose the way that we react to all of these uh, chemicals that we digest, our metabolic profile, also our genetic profile might affect how we react. Circumstances, uh, our environment, socioeconomic factors that dictate what we decide to eat or not eat and what we do or don't do with our life at the same time, it's an extremely complex system.
Extract 2, questions 37 to 42. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. I wrote a prescription for antibiotics. Okay. Um, I did want to talk to you, though. I'm a little bit concerned looking through his chart at how many ear infections he's had recently, and I, I noticed that you had checked the box that someone's smoking in the home, so I was wondering if you can tell me a little more about that. Well, um, it's just me and him, and I do smoke. Um, I try really hard not to smoke around him, but I... I've been smoking for 10 years, except when I was pregnant with him. But it, everything, it's so stressful being a single mom and, and my having a full-time job. And so it was just, that's why I started smoking again. You have a lot of things going on, and smoking's kind of a way to relax and de-stress. Yes. Yeah. Some people have a glass of wine, I have a cigarette. <laughs> sure. And it sounds like you're trying not to smoke around him. Why did you make that decision? I know it's not good for him. I mean, I've read those things about ear infections and asthma and stuff. And, and uh, But other kids have ear infections, and their parents don't smoke. So on the one hand, you're worried about how your smoking might be affecting him. And on the other hand, you're not so sure if it's really the smoking that's causing these problems. Right. Yeah. I mean, he doesn't have asthma. Yeah, I don't... He hasn't had a lot of other problems that his other friends have. So, and I've thought about quitting before in the past, but I just don't. I just don't see how it's possible right now. What made you decide to quit smoking when you were pregnant? Well, he was inside me, and we were sharing everything, and I knew that he would get some of that, and I didn't. I just didn't didn't think I could live with myself if something happened to him. Right now, though, it feels almost too difficult to even manage or even to try. Yeah, exactly. How were you successful when you quit before? I don't know. I I think about it now. I don't even know how I did it. I just I just did it. You know, I just I just couldn't imagine like him not being born or going into labor early mm -hmm. and and him having problems and stuff like that, all the stuff that they talk about with women who smoke. So I, that was just enough to, to say, okay, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to risk that. Mm -hmm. So The risks were so scary then that you were able to stop. But yeah. They don't feel as scary to you now. No, I mean, we're two separate people. And like I said, I, don't, I try really hard not to smoke around him. I'm pretty good about that. I, I don't let other people smoke around him. Um, so I, you know... You're doing the best you can do. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But it sounds to me, too, like part of you really does want to quit. Yeah, I, I, I know that I need to. And I, you know, keep every new year I say, okay, this year I'm going to quit smoking. But then something happens and it, it just doesn't. It's I'm on your to-do list. Enough. It's just not making it to the top. Yeah. If you did decide to quit. On a scale of 1 to 10, where 1 is not at all confident, you don't think you could do it, and 10 is you feel pretty certain that you could, where do you think you fall right now? Probably like a 5.
kind of in the unsure area. Mm-hmm. Like, I know I've done it before, so I know I can do it. But at the same time, it just seems really hard, and it's sure. not in the same situation. Well, what made you say five rather than two or three? I know. I know all the ways it's bad for me, and I don't want him to grow up thinking that it's okay to smoke. I don't want him to to use any kind of, I don't want him to chew or, or anything like that. Um, so I know I need to, especially before he gets old enough to understand mm-hmm. what mommy's doing, but I just don't know if I can do it. Okay. So it sounds like you have a lot of reasons why you'd like to quit. You have been successful quitting in the past, and right now you're just feeling a little bit hesitant about your ability to do it. Yeah. Where do you think we should go from here? I don't know. I... I'd like some help. I just don't know what kind of help I need. Sure. Well, if you'd be interested, that's something I can definitely talk to you about. There are a lot of new options that can actually help people be way more successful in their attempt at quitting. There's different medications you can try. I don't like medicine. Okay. There's also a lot of support groups and classes that you can take where you have other people to go through it with you, and sometimes just having that support can be a big part of it, especially for people like you where smoking is such a stress reliever. That sounds nice, but I'm not sure if I have the time for all that. Sure. It feels like something that would take up a lot of time and maybe not fit into your life. I wonder if we could talk about some options that might fit into your life. That would be really nice. Okay. Well, if you're willing, then we could set up another appointment where you could come in and we could talk more about that. I would like that. That would be great. Great. Thank you. Sure.